thank you everyone for coming to the Korea panel. I'm Gordon Chang. Today we're going to talk about the possibility that the free world could lose South Korea. You know, for most Americans, it's just ludicrous to think that destitute North Korea can take over South Korea, a larger and a stronger state. But that's a possibility. It's a possibility because the South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, is a progressive and his overarching goal is to unify the two Koreas. And unfortunately, he's contemplating doing that on the terms of the other Korea, North Korea. So for instance, we see Moon trying to um, undermine democracy in his own society. And that's what we'll be talking about for the next 45 minutes. Tara Oh, East Asia Research Foundation, former intelligence officer, US Air Force. What is Moon Jae-in doing? Well, Moon, the Moon administration is attacking the free and open society of South Korea. As you know, South Korea, or the Republic of Korea, is a free democracy. It's not a people's democracy, which is what North Korea calls itself, DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So one of the, there are a lot of differences between the two systems, but a key difference is freedom. And this Moon administration and his party tried to delete the term freedom from the Constitution. Now, Could you just repeat that again? Because that is absolutely startling. He and his party tried to delete the word freedom from the Constitution. Yes. So think about that. And that's, uh, if you have to go through that, then there's some, uh, some sort of uh, intent behind there. Um, so he has been, he, when I say he, I'm talking about him and his supporters, his party. They have been attacking the pillars of liberal democracy, one of which is the freedom of the press. They already jailed two journalists, Mr. Byun Hee Jae and Mr. Hwang Hee Won, in jail. And they already have controlled or dominated um, their two major um, broadcasters, NBC and KBS. And that's not enough. So they're trying to control YouTube because we're, that's where some of the voices that are not in the mainstream media are going to. So they're trying to control that. And recently, they are trying to control people's access to websites that begin with HTTPS, S for secured. So that's why it's going on in the, the information and media freedom of the press realm. Um, but also, another important pillar of uh, free democracy is the rule of law. And the rule of law is severely weakened under the Moon administration. What they have done is to use the laws to silence, to harass, to jail, and to bankrupt the critics and their political opponents. National security realm, um, <clears throat> he is basically destroying South Korea's defense capabilities. And one of the prime examples is the military agreement that was signed between South Korea and North Korea last September. Uh, what South Koreans, some of the South Korean military professionals call this surrender document. So that's how bad it is. And just one more thing. In the economic realm, they do not like the concept of private ownership of property. They like public ownership. So they want to introduce this uh, term called uh, public concept of land ownership. What that means is there's, the land is privately owned, but it's the government that will determine its use. So that's an interim step towards government ownership. So what the Moon administration is doing is to put South Korea on a path towards socialism. So, um, Shun Park, um you're famous for being a video blogger in South Korea uh, under the name of Bangmo, and it really is an honor to share the stage with you, and thank you for coming over from South Korea. Um, you, you heard uh, Tara talk about what the Moon administration's been doing, and, and obviously this, this whole drive towards, uh, the other things are just horrible, but one thing in particular I wanted to focus on with you, and that is um, Tara talked about how they're moving toward a more socialist economy. 
Um, what effect is that having on economic growth in South Korea? And what is the popularity, you know, how does that affect uh, Moon's popularity? Okay. Uh, let me just uh, make a differentiation between a, I call domestic policy, and the other one is security policy, uh, which covers the relationship between uh, North and South, and the, the relationship between uh, Korea and China, and the relationship between Korea and the U.S. So we are talking about the domestic, domestic policy, especially in terms of the economic policy. And, you know, they, they do like, they, they have done, they scrapped, they wanted, they, they are in the process of, for example, scrapping the atomic power plants, nuclear power plants. The Korean economy is very much dependent on cheap energy, cheap electricity. Because so this is going to raise the price of, of electricity? Yes, that is one example. And another example is that they openly talk about so-called income-driven growth, which means that if the government intervenes in the market via policy or via legislation to hike up the wage, then the higher nominal wage will just lead the economy to grow. So this is what Tara was talking about in terms of moving yeah, towards so socialism, which, this yeah, income-driven growth. So they, for example, raised 30% for two years of the minimum wage, and the result is that millions of people are driven out, and most of them are just uh, the, most, uh, the poorest people. So in terms of a domestic policy, the Moon Jae-in government is losing popularity very rapidly, very, very rapidly. So these days, people dis, uh, you know, distinguish two, two, two types of policies. That is, inter they are talking that this guy, this moon guy, has ruined the country. Many, many people are saying that, but still, they say that thanks to him, we have avoided war with North Korea. So when, when you take a look at, at these two mix, these domestic policy and security policy, which one's more important in the minds of South Koreans? Uh, let me tell you one, one thing. You know, uh, this, like, uh, you know, ever since the U.S. has began, begun the, hum, uh, the honeymoon with China back in 1971. Uh, Big mistake, by the way. Uh, well, <laughs> maybe it was inevitable because the, it was, uh, she, she was losing in the China anyway. So... So, you know, ever since, you know, the, the Koreans were put in a situation to just, uh, to, you know, to, to survive no matter what. So, for the last three decades, uh, a first dilemma, like a war vis-a-vis -vis peace, you know, that dilemma has influenced the Korean people very, very deeply. I can see that. Uh -huh. David Maxwell. Um, colonel, former Colonel, U.S. Army, Special Forces Operator, five tours of duty in South Korea. That's amazing. <laughs> five tours of duty. <laughs> you, you heard um, Bang Mo talk about the division in, uh, you know, the way people look at uh, Moon Jae-in. And you also heard Tara talk about uh, attempts by Moon to reduce the capability of the South Korean Army. You have often taught me and, and others, a whole generation of, of Korea people, about the North Korea's plans to subvert, coerce, intimidate, and perhaps use force against the South Korean state. Kim Jong-un, you know, has been doing a lot of smiling these days in Hanoi and elsewhere. Um, has the Kim family abandoned that plan to take over the South? Absolutely not. And I think we saw evidence of this uh, in Hanoi. Uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, uh, well, first of all, you use the word subversion. Subversion is the undermining of the power, authority, and legitimacy of a government. You know, as in, from North Korea's perspective, the ruthless subversion of democracy. And North Korea's strategy since Kim Il-sung's time has been to use subversion, coercion, extortion, and if necessary, force to unify the Korean Peninsula under northern domination to ensure survival of the Kim family regime. Not survival of the nation state, not survival of the Korean people living in the north, survival of the regime. 
And a supporting element of that is divide and conquer. Divide the Rock US alliance to be able to conquer the Rock. That is its strategy in a nutshell. Now, this is political warfare, uh, and it is, uh, and we've seen Kim engage with the US executing what I would call the long con. And uh, he is really trying to con us. He's been masterful at getting something for nothing. And, uh, and that's happened uh, for decades, his father and grandfather. But President Trump yesterday called him on it. And walking out of that meeting was probably the best thing the president could ever do. Uh, and so... <laughs> but the North wants to subvert the South. And we have to ask ourselves, and, and this is really an ideological battle on the peninsula. The Koreans I know and have served with, had the honor to serve with, uh, we believe in shared values. Freedom, you know, individual liberty, liberal democracy, free market economy, and human rights. Those are the shared alliance, ROC US alliance values. You know, North Korean values, I hate to, I won't really call them real values, but it is Juche ideology, Kim Il-sungism, you know, Byung-jin, Song-boon, Song-goon, uh, and in the denial of human rights in order to keep the Kim family regime in power. Now, that's the choice of the Korean people on the peninsula. You know, for all Korean people, North and South, what values do they want to adhere to? And the North is trying to subvert the South. It is really key. When you look at the United Front Department, the 225th Bureau, uh, infiltrating agents to stand up opposition political parties. You know, this is what the North does. And if you read the North Korean Constitution, their mission is to complete the liberation of the peninsula, complete the revolution, and dominate the peninsula under socialism. And you know what? And one thing that Kim Jong-un has learned with the opening of the 400 markets, it takes capitalism to feed socialism. And that's something that, uh, that he has learned, but he will never embrace, because to embrace capitalism will mean the downfall for Kim Jong-un. So Tara, you've heard Dave Maxwell talk about how the North has not given up its goals of taking over the South. Um, as difficult as that may be for some Americans to wrap their minds around it, the North is still at it. You know, you talked about in your initial um, answer this whole idea that Moon Jae-in is reducing the capability of the South Korean army by um, eliminating divisions, by reducing conscription periods, all the rest of it, that surrender agreement that you mentioned, well, why would Moon do that? Is, is he um, thinks it doesn't matter, or is he a co-conspirator? Let me uh, answer that by saying what he wrote in his biography. It's called, uh, in Korean, Unmyeong. Uh, which means either faith or destiny. He was reading, when he was, uh, I guess, a college student, he was reading about um, the Vietnam War and how U.S. was leaving. And basically, the book described it as uh, Vietnam winning over U.S. lost in Vietnam, and U.S. is being kicked out. And so when he said, when he read that portion, he said he was ecstatic. So it, it sort of shows where his mind is. I mean, for most Koreans who are very grateful towards Americans, to the United States for the sacrifice, they would not think that way. But Moon Jae-in thought that way. And he has a strong background in, um, you know, you, everyone has heard that he is a so-called human rights lawyer who never talks about human rights issues with North Korea. And, you know, you may wonder, well, what kind of human rights lawyer was he? Well, he and, um, the former president, No Myun, they were partners, law par partners, and they really only sought out those who tried to subvert South Korea's system, the ones who want to overthrow South Korea's liberal democracy and market economy. Those are the ones he sought out and defended. So I just want to let you know that that's his background. Okay, um, questions in a moment, but before we do that, Bongmo, you've, you've heard about, um, you know, Dave and Tara talk about the subversion of South Korea. Um, is Kim Jong-un actually winning this struggle at this particular moment? He would have won without Trump administration. But I think this United States, the great country, has a very vital strategic interest in the Korean Peninsula. And there are some resistance 
by some Korean people who are who 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 have understood, who have uh, identified the real intention of the Moon, Moon government, and I think their intention is to make a pro-China, anti-U.S., North and South Federation. You know, uh, you talk about the resistance in South Korea. We have some people over here in, in white baseball caps, Save Korea Foundation, who are working very hard to preserve South Korea democracy. Um, Lawyer Kim, if you're here, if you could just stand up and maybe take a bow. Yes. <laughs> Questions over here. No, your voice is actually big enough, so. Okay. Uh, Frank De Barona, Bay of Peaks veteran from Miami. I've read that North Korea is printing dollars and euros that are almost perfect, that they export drugs to China that eventually enters the United States. Why is it that we're not reading that in our press? Because that would make people more aware of the danger of North Korea to our security. That's a Maxwell question. So there's an organization in, in North Korea called Department 39. They conduct North Korea's global illicit activities, not only counterfeiting our $100 bills. Why do we have new $100 bills? Because they're so good at counterfeiting and euros. They counterfeit medicine. They, they traffic in methamphetamines. Uh, they counterfeit other medicines to include Viagra. Uh, they counterfeit cigarettes. You know, these, are, these illicit activities that are being conducted around the world using North Korean diplomatic channels uh, in countries around the world, of course, is to gain hard currency to support the regime. Uh, and yes, I wish the press would, would write more about it. The good news is, is that part of our maximum pressure policy, since President Trump has taken office, uh, the U.S. State Department has worked very hard with countries around the world uh, to help them with information and to help them enforce their own laws. Because North Korea is breaking not only international law, using diplomats to break, uh, you know, to conduct illicit activity, but they're breaking local laws. And so we've seen countries around the world, Poland, Mexico, uh, Philippines, Peru, uh, uh, Qatar, uh, not only uh, expelling diplomats, uh, but also ending uh, with the real scourge from uh, North Korea, the slave labor that it exports. Uh, laborers around the world, you know, living in, in poor conditions uh, for, for very little wages, uh, and most of the wages, of course, go to the regime. And so uh, our State Department and our, the U.S. government has been very focused on this uh, since really since June of 2017. It's one of the unknown parts of uh, our maximum pressure ca campaign. Uh, and it's having some effect, but we've got to press harder because North Korea is a resilient, adaptive, innovative, uh, uh, illicit actor. Uh, and so they, they adapt to, these, uh, to, to the work that's being conducted against them. Dave, I got a question for you. Talking about counterfeiting of $100 bills, they're called the Super K notes. I've heard this, I've, I've read this, I don't know if this is true or not, but how, how does our U.S. Treasury Department determine the difference between Super K notes and actual real $100 bills? Well, the answer is that the printing on the Super K counterfeited notes is better than our printing. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that same, uh, I've, I've heard that, but I have no, no knowledge and, and certainly no expertise in that area. There's a question over here. Well, this is Dan Moon. I helped to cons consult the uh, Save Korea Foundation, Peter Kim Lawyer here. Now, last night after watching Hanoi summit with Kim and Trump, I come up with a very strong feeling that year 2009, this 2099 is a year that we will just settle the issue of Korea. I believe that Korea has been divided into two blocks physically, spiritually, ideologically, so, so long, and we left North Korea with what we call the idolatry, cultic Kim dynasty, who would like to control not only the entire Korean peninsula, but also the entire world, threatening uh, uh, the United States even lately. Now, yesterday when I heard Trump making a very strong response to conspiracies and, and all the deceits that have been practiced from the days of Truman to Obama. I finally realized that Trump 
as America, save America first, or what do you call America first president, really did outstanding job to warn them that he's meaning a business. Can, can we actually talk about um, this whole notion that this is going to be settled soon? What do you think about that? I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure, but I, I do strongly feel that, you know, when you fight against something, the concept, the structure is so vital that I think this struggle has shown its own essence more and more clear day after day. The essence is a struggle against the totalitarian triangle, which means the totalitarian or Orwellian reaction in China and the democidal totalitarian cult in Pyongyang and quasi-totalitarianism in Seoul. So I think, and it is my, you know, many, many Koreans really begin to realize that this struggle is fought together with people here and people over there. So Tara, um, just to take that step one further, um, we just heard talking about a sort of an authoritarian, maybe even a semi-totalitarian system for South Korea. Are, are we headed that direction? Well, it appears so because, as I said earlier, you need certain ingredients for free democracy, like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the rule of law. And if these are being torn down, then you are going in the other direction, which is towards authoritarian and totalitarian society. So it could go much further than we thought. Um, question right over here. My question is, I, maybe for Tara more than others, but uh, what is it in Korean society that has at least weakened the defenses against the kinds of ideas you're suggesting Moon is doing? I what mean, a great what is it? I mean, it seems like a very economically successful society. I mean, you can point to it just a, I mean, it's a great development success story. So what is it that's caused that vulnerability? That's a really great question. And I can't answer it, so I'm glad he directed it to you. Yeah, I think I probably need help because um, it's, I don't think that's just one answer. Um, but, uh, you know, if I have to pick one item, uh, education is, is one. Um, there's a... Um, KGB agent who talked about subversion. Um, he defected the U.S. back in the 80s, and he talked about the first stage, which is um, first stage of subversion, is to basically change people's mindsets. And he says it takes about 20 years because that's how long people are staying in the education system. So I think um, I think teaching people uh, certain ideology is one certain way of thinking. For example, in South Korean history textbooks, they no longer teach that North Korea attacked South Korea during the Korean War. So if you teach items like that, people are going to have different uh, perception about North Korea. So I think that's one. I, I, I think there are plenty of other reasons, and maybe uh, you know, Mr. Park has some more, because he actually has been through that period. Uh, but so I would say is, is people's mindset has changed through education system, and that's one of them. Yes, over here. Uh, my name is uh, Nam Shin Oh, uh, and uh, I work on uh, North Korea human rights issue, and uh, I've listened to you many, many, many times. Uh, the coming from human rights issue. Uh, this question is not being asked uh, lightly. Uh, uh, Dave, do you think uh, uh, we can solve uh, this uh, problem in Korea without a war? Dave, you did a lot of planning for that. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, I, I really don't think there is a, a path from our present to a unified or a united Republic of Korea, uh, which I think is necessary for us to see an end to the nuclear program and an end to the human rights atrocities, the crimes against humanity that are being committed by the Korean people living in the North. I want to deter war. 
Uh, and, and I believe we, the Rock U.S. Alliance, is not going to start a war, but of course, when the North does, we will finish it. Uh, and then we will end up with a secure, stable, economically vibrant, uh, non-nuclear peninsula uh, that's unified under a liberal constitutional form of government determined by the Korean people. But human rights is not only a moral imperative, it's a national security issue. Yes. And, and North Korea denies human rights to remain in power, mm. but it also uses uh, and abuses its people uh, to mine uranium, to build weapon systems, uh, and, and to, to conduct the labor that it needs to survive. And we know that when we talk about North Korea's nuclear program, it legitimizes the regime. But when we talk about North Korean human rights, it undermines the legitimacy of Kim Jong-un. Absolutely. That's why we need yeah. a dual approach, not only the nuclear program, but human rights as well. It is a national security issue and a moral imperative. If I ask one more question. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I venture to say I'm 100% behind the President uh, Trump. I've never seen any, uh, anyone like him. Uh, I worked uh, since uh, uh, how many years? Uh, 30 years before. Uh, that, do you think? Uh, do you think he has uh, more uh, in his uh, pocket and brain than maximum pressure? Yes, there's, there's much more than maximum pressure. Certainly his advisors do. We really need to take a holistic strategy. Maximum pressure, or what I would like to call it now, we'll probably go into maximum pressure 2.0, but I would like to see it really be a strategic strangulation campaign. Uh, but uh, there's much more than that. It is human rights. Uh, it is information and influence. You know, what the escapees from North Korea do to get information into, into the North is very important. We should ask ourselves the question, though, who is Kim Jong-un more afraid of, the United States or the Korean people living in the North? And I would argue it's the Korean people living in the North when they're armed with information. And that's one of the things that should be part of a maximum pressure 2.0. Uh, so I think we have a lot more than, uh, than just sanctions. Bung Mo, just, if you could just chime in on that. Um, Dave asked a question. Who is Kim Jong-un most afraid of? Who do you think? He is, he is right. Actually, you know, the, I think I would, I would say respect for geopolitical compromise be, between U.S. and China has been too long. Hi, uh, my name is Young Kim. Um, I want to give you some tidbits of information in the history. Um, this nuclear weapon missile system, $8.3 billion of funds, funding has gone from South Korea to North Korea over the last 20 years, over two leftist, clearly leftist governments. Um, and their five-year terms. Now, we have three more years remaining under um, uh, Moon Jae-in, and the funding for those fighters who want to preserve the values of, um, of liberal democracy, human rights, um, funding has just evaporated overnight. Um, so how can we, as conservative global community um, connect together and work at fighting this, this, this trend. I mean, it's 100 years after Bolshevik Revolution, and the same, exactly same pattern of takeover is happening in South Korea. Tara, can you sort of start us off on an answer to that? Answer to the, uh, the South Korea transferring money to build weapons in North Korea? How can we fight that? Yeah, how can conservatives work mm. to prevent um, what Moon Jae-in is doing to subvert uh, democracy, but also to support North Korea? Because he mentioned mm. um, South Korean support for uh, the North Korean missile and nuke programs. Uh, that's a tough question, and I think that is a That's question. why you got it. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things is just like North Korea not getting uh, external information in, there are a lot of things that's going on in South Korea. There's a lot of information, but it's not coming out to the United States elsewhere. 
Um, and also within South Korean society as well because of the suppression of the media that I mentioned earlier. So I think um, there should be a more concerted effort to get the information um, within South Korea to other um, uh, you know, part of the population who's not familiar with what's going on. Um, so that would be through education and seminars and things like that. Uh, but also getting all these out in English so that the external audience know what's going on in South Korea. And let, so, me just, yeah. let me just mention, oh, okay. Yeah, and I, 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 I want to just mention, getting it out in English, Tara performs a great service with her East Asia Research website, uh, translating uh, information from Korea into English so that, that we can see that. I would urge all of our Korean friends to help with translation uh, and to help Tara in her work because it is really key. And, and how do we counter that as conservatives? Uh, you've got a network. You know, you've got to, we've got to work together, whether you're Korean or American or any conservative around the world. You know, I've always studied North Korea and the potential for resistance by the Korean people in the North. You know, well, <laughs> the same principles of resistance, uh, organization, you know, information, uh, influence, all those, uh, you know, we need to counter North Korea, North Korea's subversion, but also strengthen the values, uh, our, our shared values, in Korea, in the United States. Again, you know, freedom, individual liberty, liberal democracy, uh, free market economy, and human rights. We share those values, we need to practice those values, and, and we need to emphasize those values in all that we do, because that is the best counter to the subversion of the North and those who would do harm uh, to our great societies. Yes, everyone who wants to know what's going on in South Korea needs to speak to these two people right here. Tara's East Asia research site is absolutely fabulous because if you want to know what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, what's going on, the important issues, that's, it, that, that's at her site. Question over here. Yes, sir. My question has to do with the uh, influence of China, not necessarily in South Korea, but North Korea. When I visit, uh, visited China, uh, it appears that Chinese people sincerely believe North Korea is their land. Um, going back several hundred years ago, that it's a land of Goguryeo, it's one of their tribes. And no matter what the outcome of negotiation between North and South, whether it's good or bad, uh, my concern is that China is not going to let the two countries to unite or unify. And that's my concern and fear. Just want to know what you may have to say about that. I think an, an important metric is that Kim Jong Un has gone to Chinese soil four straight times: three times last year, one time this year. Um, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, has not gone to North Korea once. That shows the nature of that relationship. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Cheng. Uh, when I uh, talk about South Korean, some guy, his name is Moon Jae-in. I cannot call his name without calling him Pal Gengi first. Pal Gengi in Korean means communist. He's a communist. He's uh, the enemy of the U.S. We all know here. And now uh, he's making whole country as a political prison. Now, two former prison, uh, presidents are in jail. Nobody knows the exact name, but uh, more than 100 people, important the former uh, uh, the, uh, um, government, uh, are in jail, including four uh, KCIA chief, and one, one person came out, but three still in jail. Now, two. one forced three-star general uh, suicided, jumping from 17, um, 17 uh, story uh, building. Let me, let me just when, stop there no, because... No, uh, let me just, just, before I forget, Mr. Cheng, please let me, uh, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna just uh, uh, ask, uh, ask somebody, uh, a reporter, uh, if there is a reporter, uh, came from uh, v, uh, Voice of America, especially Korean language team here. If, 
Yeah, you know, we've only got about 10 minutes, and I want to get an answer to that question. Um, both Tara and Bongmo, I'd like you to get your views. Tara, you first about the jailing um, of military officers and uh, former case, uh, KCIA people. Um, as he mentioned, yes, uh, so current administration has jailed two former presidents. And there's one other former president. He's uh, in his 90s, and he's being sued uh, for one reason or another. So all of them are either harassed or jailed. Um, as far as uh, uh, political uh, opponents, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they used a law to uh, place all kinds of charges on them until uh, they find something that click, or even if it doesn't, they still send them to jail without evidence. A lot of these people are in jail without evidence. Um, so that is going on. In terms of the um, <clears throat> What he means by KCI, it's NIS, is the latest name, National Intelligence Service. Um, there are, I believe, about 50, over at, at least 50 NI, former NIS officials who are in jail right now, or who are under investigation. So they're really cleaning the house out in NIS. NIS, and there's another uh, organization called DSC, Defense Security Command. Those two are the two key organizations that does counterintelligence. What that means is they look for North Korean agents and spies. They put them to jail. But uh, President Moon Jae-in, he dismantled the DSC, the second one, completely dismantled it. The first one, he had a this reform committee whose uh, committee chair said the problem with NIS is that it's, it's, focused as too fo it's too focused on catching North Korean agents and spies. So they took away that function. So. Um, again, you know, they're, they're in jail, but it's, it's, a, it's really uh, the Moon administration's to efforts to dismantle those capabilities. And, and the first part of the question was about whether Moon Jae-in is actually a communist or not. I know that's a little bit sensitive, but um, if you could just give me your thoughts on that. Uh, Maybe I should say that. No, 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 yeah? no. Okay, good. Yeah, no, there was a, there was a ju judgment by the court and uh, a very influential person in my country called him a sort of a communist. And he was, I mean, he was not, not found guilty. Because, you know, my belief is that if you call somebody a communist, it is not about his honor. It is about what my own evaluation. So, it is not a kind of a, how can I say, defaming. So I can call him a sort of a communist, right? Okay. I, I noticed that Daniel Cho has is, is just come in, and he's done a lot of work in terms of um, the advisors for Moon Jae-in and their former Jusa Pa affiliations. In other words, that they believed in the Juche revolution when they were in college. They have now become senior advisors to Moon Jae-in, and they've not disavowed their views. Um, he's done a lot of work on this. It's really important stuff. And, and in addition to consulting these three guys up here, you should talk to Daniel about many of these things. There's a question over here. Um, what concrete steps is the U.S. capable of doing both in terms of uh, practical ability and political will to uh, deter further aggression from the North, particularly as uh, these uh, negotiations that are going on may or may not turn out to be successful as part of the maximum pressure 2.0 campaign that you were alluding to earlier. Yeah, uh, Colonel, this was your life's work, so. Yeah. So I think one thing we, we ought to understand, the Kim family regime will never attack strength. And I think that uh, we, should, we should realize that we are not gonna be successful uh, against North Korea without the strength of the ROC US alliance. And so it is very important that, uh, that we demonstrate strength, strategic reassurance, strategic resolve. Uh, we train our forces, we deploy our forces, uh, and we demonstrate that strength. Deterrence is, is job one. US for, the 28,000 US forces in Korea don't defend Korea. They deter attack. South Korean military, uh, despite the recent weakening, uh, is capable of defending Korea. Uh, but it is the presence of the U.S. forces, and we know that from when Hwang jong yap defected. We asked him why they've spent all this money on the North Korean military and have never attacked the South. And say so can't win a war with the U.S. and South Korean forces. And so, and, and they believe that we will respond with nuclear weapons. 
So that has a strong deterrence. So we've got to be strong. We've got to demonstrate that. We can't weaken our alliance. That is really critical uh, going forward, that we have a strong, united, rock U.S. alliance. And one of the important things here is that uh, for more than a century, we have drawn our western defense perimeter not off the, our coast, not even off the coast of Guam, but off the coast of East Asia. And South Korea anchors the northern end of our western defense perimeter. And just let me add, what happens on the Korean Peninsula, I mean, deterring war and conflict on the Korean Peninsula is so important, not only for the, our, our Korean allies, and uh, whom we all love, uh, but Korea, and the Koreans will know, the shrimp among whales, you know, it is at the nexus of the second and third largest economy in the world. South Korea is anywhere between the eighth and eleventh largest economy. Two nuclear powers, Russia and China. What happens on the Korean Peninsula is going to have global effects. If there is war or any kind of conflict, it's going to impact everyone. Therefore, it is in our interest to deter war. And the presence of U.S. forces combined with uh, the ROC military deters war. And so we need to focus on that. Okay, we are just out of time, but we do have a few moments for the lightning round for the Korea panelists. I'd like to ask each of you one minute, starting with Bong Mo, whether in, uh, you know, Moon Jae-in has three more years left in his term. Um, are we going to have South Korea remain a free, independent society when Moon Jae-in calls it quits? One Moon minute. Moon Jae-in calls it quits? I mean, you know, basically end of his term. The, uh, at the end at, of his term. At the end of his term, sorry. It depends on the question the, the gentleman, uh, no, no, it depends on the question the gentleman asked over there. He, he raised a very important question. Why such a country so prosperous as South Korea ever be, uh, ha, has fallen into the prey of this type of pro-totalitarianism or pro-China or pro-North pro pro Korea? That was a great uh, that, question. That is a mental, it is basically a mental game, a cultural game. So it depends on the Korean people to find a way to fight this mental game. Okay, and by the way, you Koreans in the audience, you heard that answer, which is absolutely correct. Tara, one minute. I, I think, um, you know, for the U.S. audience, um, I would encourage you to um, not only pay attention to North Korea and what's going on with North Korean nuclear weapons, but also South Korea as well. Um, so, so that we can discover what is really going on. And for those in South Korea, um, you know, I talked about getting the information out earlier, but I think there also needs to be a, some sort of long-term strategy. And I, you know, after the Moon administration's term, I don't think that from that point on, things will improve. I think this is very, very deep rooted within the society, throughout the society, in different segments of the society. So I really think they have a lot of work ahead, but they really need to have a good vision of their future and, and, and uh, also you know, identify what they value. Of course it's liberal democracy, market economy, but really they need to clearly identify and identify that to the people so that people can start valuing those principles and also be willing to defend that and to do something about it. Colonel. Well, I'm bullish on the Republic of Korea, and I think it will make, you know, it's like Nietzsche said, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. And they make it through this period, Korea will be stronger. I'm bullish because I think while we have uh, the generation we see represented here, conservatives who are true patriots, who believe and have fought for their country, uh, you know, we have this 386 middle generation that is, I think, at the root of the problems. But I think we have a large young generation in Korea who are practical uh, and, and smart and, and want uh, free markets and want to succeed. They need to be imbued with the same patriotism and spirit of the older generation. It's the middle generation that, uh, that needs to be bypassed, and, uh, but the large young generation is really the future of Korea. And I urge all of the Koreans here to make sure that the youth in Korea are imbued with the right values uh, because that will make Korea great as well. Well, South Korea clearly is facing uh, existential challenges. 
but because of what we've heard, I think that we can say that there are the forces that will resist, that will protect freedom and democracy in Korea. Please join me in thanking the panel.